There's times in our lives where God seems to be silent. We pray and we ask him for guidance. And it seems as though we can't hear. In such seasons, we trust God to lead us. And we place one foot in front of the other. And I've had seasons in my life, and so have you, where this is the case. And then there are seasons in life, there are times when God gets our attention very clearly and very creatively for certain purposes. And as your pastor, I've been praying this new year for direction as to where I'm to take the assembly as far as teaching and preaching the Word of God. And um, I've been intending to start a new series, but at this particular time, God has really impressed a word on my heart in my prayer this week. And um, it, it was just gripping me. I'm not exactly sure why this is the word that God's brought to my attention this week. As a matter of fact, my heart is a little bit, how do you say, conflicted, I guess in bringing this message. Why? Sometimes, folks, the message of God is very light and jovial and uh, something that we take with us and it kind of brings spring to our step. But there are times when God brings a serious word because there is a serious thing going on somewhere behind the scenes. And I believe I've been led to, you, to speak with you on a passage of Scripture found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 this morning. And this sermon that I've titled, I've titled it because of what is said in this particular passage. My sermon is, Escape from the Trap of Sardis. And the passage I have this morning for you contains both a warning and an encouragement. And the letter was written by the Apostle John in a revelation that was given to him directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the words of Jesus that he speaks to the church in Sardis. Now, for those of you who don't know what Sardis is, okay, it's not that little place by Chilliwack. Okay, right. I know that some of you maybe have escaped the trap of Sardis. But that's not the Sardis we're talking about this morning. No. Sardis, you see, was an important city in the region of Asia Minor, which is uh, in modern-day Turkey. And Sardis was uh, a very wealthy city, It was a commercial trading post, and um, like many other cities in its day, it was well known as the center for pagan worship and immoral revelry. It was a real pagan um, city that, in this particular case, the people worshipped both the goddess Sibel, who was um, in the in the in their mind, the mother, to be the mother of all gods, to be the mother of Zeus. Um, There was other worship of different deities. It was a very pantheistic city, you could say. Um, They even had the the temple, the main temple, to Sibyl. And uh, she, she is, they believe, to be like Artemis of the Ephesians, the same deity in Asia Minor here. Um, They also had in the temple a division, and on the other side in this temple, they worshipped the Roman imperial family. So it was a center for the worship of the Caesars as demigods or gods in the world. 
So the ruins of this temple stand in the ancient city until this day. And if you look online at Sardis and you see the ruins, you'll notice that the place uh, is very beautiful. It's a, a beautiful, beautiful setting. Very, and, and during its, its heyday, it was very wealthy. And, and one of the reasons they established this place there is because it was fortified. And it was very hard for armies to uh, enter the city to conquer it. So they had these high cliff, uh, it was almost, almost like walls around cliff kind of structure that was very difficult for any army to get up into and, and conquer. Despite this fact, though, twice in its history, the city of Sardis was overrun and conquered by foreign armies, first by the Persians under Cyrus the second of Persia, and Alexander the Great, some 200 years later. And according to stories, Cyrus, um, when he took it over, he had spies sent in to, to, to look at this city to see where the best point of entry might be. And the story is told that some, uh, one of the Sardinian uh, soldiers on the wall, his helmet fell off his head, and it bounced down into the bottom. And then the spies are watching, and like, how's he going to get that, or is he going to get it? And sure enough, he comes, and they see that there was a trail, a secret trail, that was hewn in there somewhere that was, wasn't easily identifiable, but they saw it as this guy came down. So they went back, reported to their commander, and Cyrus or gave the order, and his army just went straight up where that guy had come out of, and they took the city with almost out of fight because everyone in that city was so comfortable and so secure thinking that they were safe, they didn't realize their weaknesses. And they put themselves in great peril due to their careless approach towards their defenses. And there's a reason I'm telling you all of this. It seems as though in this city, there was a spirit of overconfidence and acceptance of the diverse moral and religious practices which dominated the culture here. It wasn't a city that persecuted its religions. It was a city that openly welcomed religions of all kinds. This is the state of this particular city. And unlike many of the early churches, even though the majority of people worship the patron gods of the Greek and Roman pantheon, the Christians here didn't have to fear persecution. They weren't persecuted that much. They were just accepted as one of many gods that were operating in their city. The Jews as well. The Jews had this massive synagogue built in the city as a huge synagogue. One of the most beautiful structures to this day. You can still see the marble mosaic laid out in the synagogue there. So considering all of these things, John, in his revelation, was given the following message for the church in Sardis by the Lord Jesus. And this is what he said. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Heavy words. I don't know who the pastor was in that church. But when the Lord Jesus spoke those words and this letter was given, I bet you there was some trembling and some falling down on knees when it came. When Jesus spoke to John about Sardis, he had some very stern words for them. And John wrote this letter on the island of Patmos. The letter was written and then charged to the care, apparently as all the other seven churches, were given these letters. It was charged to the care of an angel who was responsible for looking out for the specific church under his care. 
And the Greek word for angel translates as messenger. It's thought, and the thought behind this is that there are angels that are posted as guardians of churches. There's most likely an angel that's posted as guardian over our church. Thank goodness. But Christ sends his letters to each church by angelic messenger, and he addresses them to the angel of each church, suggesting that it was expected that the contents of the letter would be promptly and carefully delivered to the people under their charge. Now, a lot of people, when they read some of the stuff in Revelation, get confused because there's a lot of poetic, a lot of picturistic language, a lot of symbolic language in it. But whenever you see God mentioning something in the scriptures with the number seven in it, you understand what number seven means is actually, the, it stands for completeness. Number seven in this passage represents the completeness of God. The letters of Jesus to the seven churches in Revelation describe the message of Christ to the complete spectrum of types of churches that were present in those days and throughout the entire ages to come, which is where we are right here in the last days. So we can take and we can apply the different messages that God said to his different churches because each of these different churches had different strengths and different weaknesses that they had struggled with. And when we observe our lives and where we are at, we can take strengths and weaknesses that we have in our own church. And don't forget what the church is. The church isn't this building. The church is the people. Each one of you is part of the body of Christ. You are the church. The people that are going to other assemblies in our community are part of the church. Believers all over the world that believe that Jesus is their Savior and have accepted them as their, 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 their Lord and Savior, they are part of the church. And this message is in part to everyone to search and to see what the Spirit would say to the individual and also to the corporate church. Jesus starts by reminding the people that he is at the center of it all. For in Jesus Christ is the completeness of God. There is nothing missing. He is totally God. The Bible says that he was totally man as well. He is the God-man. He is God who came to us to show us what God was like with skin on. This message comes from the immortal God who was and is and is to come. The great I am. There is no deficiency in Jesus. He is almighty. He starts by reminding the people that he's the center of it all. He has the fullness of the Holy Spirit in himself. And he has the Holy Spirit in fullness to give to his church. That's why they call the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all one. One God. Three persons. But one. We're told in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 27 that the entire spectrum of churches throughout history is one body of which Christ is the head. You are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And he is the one who holds power and authority over all of his churches. See, this church here, it's not mine. It's not any one person's, except for one. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. This church is not an institution of man. This church is the blood-bought bride of Jesus Christ. And each one of you that believes is part of it. You see, when you look at this message from the Lord to Sardis, we can look at our culture and we can see similarities. Our church is in a place today where there is a very prosperous and easy living culture all around us. Yeah, there's hard times for sure, 
But our hard times are nothing compared to places in other corners of this globe. I mean, our poor are rich here compared to others in the world. We are prosperous, easy living, focused on entertainment, a passive tolerance of immoral behavior across the board in our land, but also a diversity of beliefs in various deities mingled with the worship of politics and everything that it brings with it and political figures. You see it? The same sort of environment. Human nature has not changed. The sinful heart of man gravitates towards the things that the, the heart of the flesh wants. And in our society, it is loose living, it is laid back, not caring about truth, and I'm speaking as a whole, but more about pleasure. So, you look at our politics. Our culture is defined by its leadership. Look at the liberal values that have taken root in the past number of years because we have wanted that as a society. We've asked for it, so we're getting what we asked for. And you might say, I don't want that. But guess what? The majority of the people in our society want what they're getting. People worship at the altar of these views. They appoint their politicians. And the educational institutions spin, as do the media outlets, spin the message of the godlessness and immorality of the sinful fallen human nature. Just like the people of ancient Rome paid homage to their emperors and the words and their views, our culture buys all of this and it becomes a matter of worship. As a result, to its detriment, and this overconfident demeanor its spirit of tolerance, of immorality. Our culture has little or no connection points to the God who created them. And they have become ripe for the conquering. The watchfulness that is essential to a society to keep safe has been lost on a large scale in many sectors. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. A careless demeanor, not watchful, that there may be an enemy that approaches. An enemy that wants to crush the city and take it over. That's our culture. You see where we're going? We've seen the slide. It's only a matter of time. If we continue down this trajectory, God will allow our fair country to be conquered, and it's not going to be pretty. Suddenly, as a culture like the Sardinians, we're going to find ourselves in a state of captivity to forces that will not be easily overthrown once we find out the nasty truth about who the enemy really is. See, everyone thinks that they can do what they want, behave how they want, think how they want, act how they want, and there's not going to be any consequences to it, but there is coming a day of reckoning. Hmm. That's the culture. So along with the fact of the culture, the church in Sardis was steeped in the culture. You know, we're a product of our culture. And only by the redeeming grace of Christ are we able to escape the vectors that send us in the same direction as our culture. It's only by God's grace and by his miraculous bringing to life inside of us that we're able to overcome the tide of things that are taking place outside of these walls. So in Sardis, the church thought to themselves, we are alive and prosperous. Jesus knew the church at Sardis had a name. 
That is a reputation. They had a reputation of life and vitality. And if you looked at the church of Sardis, you would see signs of life and vitality everywhere. In the church of Sardis, like the city of Sardis, everything seemed to be ticking along nicely. That's the reputation. The Sardinian church had bought, unfortunately, not all of them, but a good proportion of the Sardinian church had bought into the lies of the surrounding culture and were falling into its pitfalls. Although they had a reputation for being spiritually alive and flourishing because everything looked good on the outside, the reality is that on the inside they were spiritually impoverished and needy. And the Sardinian church had their systems in place and appeared to be functioning really well, but spiritually in their connection with God behind the scenes, they were barely on life support because they had lost connection with the head and everything became about appearances and outward form. And it was all broken because the heart had become cold to the love of God. Although the spiritual fruit started to bear on the branches of the church, the culture was like an early frost that ruined the growth of the fruit before it reached its full maturity. Sadly, in this case, It had gone on long, and most of the fruit was ruined, still green, but now withered, wilted, dry, drying, and tasteless. If you can just picture like a blackberry vine with all these luscious blackberries that were kind of green, turning red, and then it gets hit by a frost. Yes, they're edible, but barely. You look at it and you go, ugh, yeah, tasteless, no sweetness to it because of the frost that had prematurely done the fruit in. The early frost ruined the sweetness of the crop that could have been a bumper crop of sweetness in the Lord's storehouse. There's a lesson in this church in Sardis for the people of our time, for the people of our country, for the people of the greater church in Canada, and for that matter, for the church in 100 Mile, and specifically for our church as well. There is a message. Maybe things have been looking pretty good on the outside, and that's great. We've been growing, and the fruit of the Spirit has been growing in us. But however, many of us are still not given over to the Lordship of Christ. It pains the heart of God. It pains Him to see the compromise with the sin of of the society that surrounds us, the materialism, the want for pleasure instead of love for God, the desire for for blessings, but no desire for holiness. What comes across the screens of our television sets and our computers is despicable and despised by the Lord. It grieves his heart. The emphasis that we place on things that are not part of his kingdom above the things that are part of his kingdom. The greed that prevails. All of these things. And I can't be the judge of this. This is God. And I don't know what goes on. All I know is that this is something that weighed on me like a thousand tons this week. And I'm speaking to somebody here. I don't know who. But this is the word of God, and I believe it's true for us today. God's giving us a warning. He's giving us a warning. Like the Sardinian Christians, our culture tolerates us, and we do not receive much in the way of persecution. Our beautiful buildings and programs rise to appear on the outside as always being healthy and strong. But Jesus has a word. He has a word for the church today in our culture And because we are here to us. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. 
for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. You know, it's not as though God has not done something good inside of us and is not working on something good inside of us. The question is not about what God is doing or what God desires to do. The question is all about yieldedness. It's about yieldedness. God, here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I looked at my own life and I looked at my own priorities. And I have to say, I humble, I, I, it humbled me because I look, I'm like, I'm a pastor and I look at my own life and it's not where I think that God wants it to be always. You're, you're in the same boat as I am. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. What is the truth of the matter? The truth of the matter is we need our God in heaven who saves, delivers, and heals to visit us in power, to release us from the things that bind us, to bring us into new life and new revelation of where he desires us to spend our energy, our time, our resources, how he wants us to organize our families, how he wants to do everything. It's all got to come through the spirit of the living God. It can't be affected by by this world or else we will find ourselves in a position like that of Sardis. Oh God, have mercy on us. You see, you have a calling, a divine calling from the Lord. Each one of you sitting here today has a divine calling from God. You're here today because the Spirit has drawn you here. You're here and like the disciples in John 15, 16, the Lord says this. He says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. What is true? The true thing is that God wants to take this church and wants to light out a flame so that it affects the streets around us, the community around us, and overflows into the region so that hearts of fire are out there in obedience to God and the light of the Spirit falls upon his church and they shine like stars in the universe as they hold out the word of life to a a congregation of people out there that know not the light. They don't know the truth. They're bound by what they don't know, but they need freedom in Jesus. And you and I are the messengers that God has called to take his message of the gospel into all the world to preach the gospel to every living creature. They are the ones that God has his eye on and he has his eye on you and he's calling you to participate with him in his good work. Isn't that great? It's exciting. This is the call of God. God is a calling for us to bear lasting fruit and he wants that fruit to develop and to hang heavy on the branches of our life but not be immaturely destroyed before it achieves its ripeness. We have to get serious. If we want to see God's hand move in power in this nation, in our community, in our families, if you want to see your kids grow up, if I want to see my kids grow up to worship the Lord, we got to get our priorities straight, people. Otherwise, we're toast. You can't stand against the principalities and powers out there on your own strength out there that are trying to disassemble everything that God wants to do. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You're not going to overcome unless you're in connection with God and unless the Holy Spirit is in you and working through you. No way. You're not going to do it. You're going to get trampled. You're going to get beaten down. And God's desire isn't that. It's not that. God wants us to live and move and have our being in him so that whatever ground we place our feet on and into victory will be there. That's his desire. Did you hear that word of Jesus to his disciples? That's his desire for you. To bear fruit through you and in your families and in your lives. That will last. There's a caveat to this though. We must be humble before our God. We must be willing to admit the the places that we're not being obedient and repent. We must submit to the will of the Holy Spirit and resist the sin and sleepy overconfidence of our culture. 
This is not time for a giant holiday, people. We have souls to win. There are people out there that are going into the very pit of hell, falling into the pit of hell. And God has called us to be his messengers so that they will find eternal life in Jesus, just as we have. Oh, folks. See, my grandpa used to work for the Department of Highways before it was privatized. And he'd get frustrated because on his crew, it was a union shop, and there was a lot of standing on shovels. <laughs> and a lot of relaxation going on and security with the union environment. So my grandpa would say, I can't stand it. He says, I go there and it's like the Department of Holidays. Well, church, sometimes we look at this life that we're in and the society that we're in and the comforts that we have around us as though we were in the Department of Holidays. No, we're running a race to win the prize. And when you run a race to win the prize, you're not walking. You're running. Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 3, 12, and this is the attitude that Christ wants for his people. Not that I've already obtained all of this or already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Oh, if what I'm saying here is resonating in some area or someone's heart, Turn to God. Turn to the Lord. Say, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I turn away from this way of, of useless living and I turn to you, God, my Savior, and I ask that you take me. Take me and do what you want with me. You know exactly what you want to do with my little life, you know, and I don't have a whole lot to offer, but whatever I have, Lord, I give unto you. Take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. See, Sardis was a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. They were all just sort of walking along, through the, going through the motions, going to their services, and having their little thing. But they weren't serious about the Lord's kingdom and his kingdom work. They lost sight of it. All the temples, I think, kind of lulled them to sleep in some regard as to what was happening with these people. These people are going to hell in a handbasket. And we are the church. Lord, help us. You see, God doesn't desire shipwrecking of our faith. He desires us to be like Paul, who run the race. And when we cross the finish line, I have run the race. I have finished the course. Now there is, for me, you know, a treasure in heaven. You know, that's what Paul alluded to. <laughs> this, and... We don't just do it for treasure. We do it because the treasure is Jesus. And we do it because we glorify him and we want him to be glorified. And how is he glorified? When sinners come to repentance so that more can come into his barn in the end at the last harvest. Timothy. Paul talked to Timothy and encouraged him in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 17 to 20. He said, Timothy, my son, or I guess 18 to 20, rather, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight, may fight the battle well. There's a word that God's given over this church. I know it. I've heard it many times. God wants to do something awesome through this church. It's been spoken in the past. It's been confirmed See, my friends, so that by recalling all the promises of God, right, God wants to bring us to battle, but not to battle on our own, to battle in sync with him. 
So Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have so suffered shipwreck with regards to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, who have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Therefore, my friends, this morning, the word of the Lord of warning to the church of Sardis has an indirect application to some of us. Probably all of us. Not saying that we can't say, like I know there's people here and I'm going to talk to you in a second because God's not just talking about chastising Sardis. He has some very good things to say about some things that are going on. Okay, But I, what I'm saying is that there's always room for us to grow further. More and more about Jesus. More closeness. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. That's the desire of God's heart. No matter how closely you're walking, God just wants you to come closer. Come closer. And, and, and the beautiful thing is that he's made the provision for it. And it's not by might or power, but it's by the Spirit of God that you draw close. He invites you. And he gives you the power to let go and come. He's invited his people. He doesn't desire shipwrecking. Therefore, the word of the Lord as a warning is this. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Remember that movie? I don't know if there's a movie. You guys watch this movie where there's... uh, a ship, and there's all these people on the ship, and there's this huge storm. I can't remember what it's called anyways. Um, Master and Commander, I think it was. But the, the one guy has tattooed on his knuckles, hold fast. <laughs> they, they were in this perilous storm. But, well, you know, we can be in the perilous storm of life, and God calls us to repent of the things that have brought us into trouble and to hold fast. In that story, those sailors went out after some whale or something where they shouldn't have gone, and it ended up being disastrous for them all. But, so, God says this. His church in Sardis needed a warning, but not everybody was compromising with the culture. Not everyone was. Maybe there's some here today. You, you can say, listen, I know I need to grow, but I, I've really said, Jesus, take it all. And, I, and I'm following him, and I love him, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, there's nothing knowingly entangling you at this point. There are people like that in our midst. And Jesus has something to say to you because he had something to say to the people that were like that in Sardis. He says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge the name, that name before my Father and his angels. You know, there's those here this morning who have been prayer warriors and are standing against the tide of social mediocrity and evil around you, who are grieved by what you see in the culture, and you pray and you share the gospel wherever you can, where God leads you. To those who've been praying for God's will to be done consistently in and through you and have been faithful to service of the King when he calls your name, the Lord is well pleased with you. He's well pleased. And like I said, it's not that he doesn't want you to grow further because you do. Because as soon as you think, eh, I'm good, then that's when the fall comes. But there are people here that really have given their hearts fully over to the gospel and to Christ. And you know who you are. I, I don't know who you are necessarily, Because a lot of the stuff that goes on behind closed doors is between you and God. 
And that's fine. Because God is the witness. But God wants you to be encouraged today to continue in the good work that he's given you to do. Because he's well pleased with that work. So, with reflection, I look on this passage of Scripture and I go, okay, God, now what? Well, kind of wrapping it up, there's a pastor named Pastor David Guzik, and he's got a, a quote that I think kind of talks about Sardis and can apply to other churches as well. He said, spiritually, there were things which remained that could be strengthened. Jesus had not given up on them, and though it was late, and that, that are ready to die, it was not too late. In history, the city of Sardis was easily conquered twice before. It wasn't that the attacking armies overwhelmed Sardis, but because of their overconfidence, their overconfidence made them stop being watchful. The spiritual state of the church in Sardis was a reflection of the city's historical character. Folks, if we found, find that God's saying, there's compromise, we need to repent. It's not a big fanfare that God's looking for. But what he's looking for is a rending of our hearts before him. Oh God, my Father, I see the areas of my life that I need to surrender to you. Take my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Take my life, Lord, and draw me near to you. Take away the things that cause me to be dull and shine brightly by your spirit inside of my spirit. That where I walk, I am a light and that people know that I am yours and that you are mine. And for those who've been walking and you're, you're like, Pastor, I just see I've been, I've been walking the best way I know how. I just need more wisdom from God. If you ask him for wisdom, he'll give it. He'll show you where you need to go from here too. And he'll lead you. He's pleased with what you, who you are and where you're at right now. But he wants you to go deeper still. This is a race. It's time to pray. Tonight, we're having a prayer meeting at the church at 7 p.m. I would invite anyone here to come to that. Prayer is so important because it puts us in line aligns us with God, God's will. It aligns our heart with his heart. That's the beauty of prayer. And then when we ask anything in accordance to his will, he will do it for the glory of his kingdom. Amen. Whoever has an ear, says John in verse 6, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen.